Yo, what's going on, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of the Off the Glass podcast. Today, we have got episode 36 for all. And if you are watching on YouTube, you can see we've got a special guest here on the podcast. Yes, sir. Noah Magaro George, who is the editor in chief of Air Alamo, which is part of the fan sided network and is also the host of the Alamo City Limits podcast. So, you can see on the screen, we're going to be talking all things Spurs here today um, in episode 36. So we're excited to dive into it. We're excited to talk about this new era of Spurs basketball. Definitely going to have to talk a lot about Victor Wembanyama and some of the, the promise and expectations that he's bringing for this upcoming season. So we're going to have a lot to get into, but we're going to start off as we always do. How are we doing today, Noah? How's your day today? I'm great, man. I, you know, I just been uh, riding about the Spurs, getting ready for the season that's coming up on Wednesday. Still trying to, uh, you know, get used to not being on my honeymoon and having like drinks mm -hmm. and food brought to me like every single day. But uh, <laughs> other than that, I'm great. I'm great. Uh, how are y'all doing? Good. Hey, and congratulations again. We, uh, you got married just it's been what two, three weeks now um, since that's happened. And uh, yeah, yeah, right it's, about, it's like a few weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Right weeks. about the. Right about the same time that you you wrapped up your honeymoon, I went out and got married. So, real bang Congrats bang. Congrats to you too. Here. Congrats to you too. Thank you, thank you. Um, but good to hear that. Um, we are excited to talk all things Spurs. We have been for a, a while now on the podcast preaching that that Wimbenyama is a real deal. Um, fighting off the Instagram comments for people that think that he's <laughs> overhyped. <laughs> um, and hopefully now people have seen from definitely the, the second summer league game, but this entire preseason that his game is translating very well, very early. I think honestly, even with my expectations, probably faster than I was anticipating. He looked very comfortable there in the preseason. Um, but really just wanted to start out with, we know that a lot of listeners of the podcast or, or just general NBA fans in general, um, you know, may have different levels of experience having watched Victor in the past. Um, some people were able to really, you know, watch him a lot. Last year when he was playing with Mets 92, some people's first introduction to him may have been, you know, Summer League of the Preseason. There's probably still a good pocket of fans who really haven't watched him play at all outside of a few highlights here or there. So just wanted to kind of get your opinion on what you think, you know, kind of some of these realistic expectations are for Victor for this, this rookie year. Yeah, I mean, that's really hard to gauge, right? Because we don't, I, I don't think we've ever seen, and, and this is going to sound cliche because everybody's been saying it, but we've never seen anybody like Wimbenyama. Like, we've seen guys who are 7'4", 7'5", 7'6", like a Yao Ming or a Sean Bradley, or even if you want to go like the skinny route, like a Manute Bowl or a Bull Bowl, like his son, like that. But nobody who's really had that level of fluidity, um, you know, athleticism, skill, um you know packaged into that frame right like we've never seen all of those things packaged into that frame and so it's it's kind of hard to know what to expect from Wimby I think some people are like oh you know he's gonna carry the Spurs the playoffs in, in in his very first season as a rookie and I think there's a lot of other people who are like oh well what what can he do that Bull Bull can't do and it's like I, I think we have to find a happy medium right because he's not Bull Bull he's not gonna be Bull Bull right and I right. <laughs> probably don't see the Spurs making the playoffs year one with Wimby because there is still that learning curve from playing with, you know, a bunch of young players going from a league like the LMB Pro A in France to the NBA, right? There, there's going to be an adjustment period, but I think he will be, at least from what I've seen from the other rookies, and, you know, I, I do a lot of draft stuff as well, I, I think he'll probably be the runaway favorite for Rookie of the Year. Like, I, I just don't see anyone else having the... You know the volume of touches the opportunity the 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 free reign to kind of take whatever shot he wants like we saw that in the preseason right like pop kept his mouth shut like even pop was like yo i kept my you know lips zipped i let him do whatever you know he he's gonna do what wimby does and i think we're gonna see that throughout the season right we're gonna see him put up big numbers i kind of have questions about the efficiency the shot selection but we're gonna see a lot of things that again like i, I don't think basketball fans have ever seen from someone his size yeah Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, one more thing about the expectation, because there's a lot of people, you know, um, expecting a lot from Wimby. You know, there's people saying if he's not a top this player or that player, you know, he's going to be <laughs> a bust and a lot of crazy stuff's been going on. You feel like um, some of the expectations and some of the, you know, uh, expectation as he's pretty much getting is a, a little bit too much. You know, some people's going a little bit too far. 
Yeah, and and I do a little bit. Like I, I love that he's getting you know a ton of praise from guys like Kevin Garnett and Paul Pierce, even on their podcast. Right? They were like, "This guy's top five skill player in the NBA right now, and they're going to make the playoffs year one." And it's like, mm -hmm. I love that they that they you know two Hall of Famers are, are, are so confident in him. But at the end of the day, like l let's go down the line of rookies, and we're not literally going to, but like. Outside of Tim Duncan, who came onto a team that was ready to compete from day one, that had David Robinson, you know, the context was different. You know, Luka Doncic is not taking his, his team to the playoffs year one. You know, you're not having, you know, a guy like Joel Embiid take, you know, his team to the playoffs year one. You're not seeing Allen Iverson take his team to the playoffs year one. You're not seeing, like, number one overall picks take their team to the playoffs in their first year. I mean, there's a reason the team got the first overall pick. They were very yeah. bad. They lost 60 games a year ago. <laughs> so I think it's just time to, you know, pump the brakes a little bit on that. But yeah, I mean, the expectations are high, but I think at the same time, right, he's he is that generational prospect. He is that guy who, you know, he could be the face of the league in a, in a few years. And I know that's putting a lot on his shoulders, but he just already from the preseason games, from what he showed with Mets 92, from what he showed in the summer league, like, this guy seems to be the real deal, and I hope he stays healthy. I think that's going to be the biggest thing for determining where he, you know, finishes in, in terms of like his legacy of his career. Yeah, we we actually just wrapped up recording another episode earlier, and we kind of did a full NBA Western Conference preview. When we got to the Spurs, <laughs> I, we both kind of sat and looked and thought, like, I think if you would have asked me probably a couple of weeks ago, I was like, yeah, no, the Spurs are probably going to be a lottery team next year. There's no real rush for them to try to accelerate this timeline any faster than it needs to be. And then the preseason happened, and I thought, maybe, you know, maybe they mess around and push for a 10 seed. But, but, you know, in all honesty, it makes a lot of sense. And their, their situation, um, the way that they've played it out with, you know, between Pop and Brian, like really not trying to rush this process at all understanding that really a lot of their core players all kind of fit the same timeline. You know, they continue to develop and grow together. I mentioned earlier that I always credit the Spurs with probably having the best relationship with their G league affiliate. Um, you know, really looking at all of their core players, like guys that are now getting those hundred million dollar extensions, all pretty much all of them spent time <laughs> in Austin. Um, yeah. So they, they do a good job at never, ever being um, impatient on development. So I, I like you would agree with you that there's no real rush to see them try to try to push for a plan or even try to do anything drastic to try to adjust what their team is right now and just kind of let things develop naturally and continue to build through the draft. Like that makes a ton of sense with a team that's as good as developing as San Antonio is. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, it's like they had like the most or second most cap space this summer. If they really wanted to go sign like a Fred Van Vliet or an Austin Reeves or something to try to win now, they, they would have, you know, like mm -hmm. if they really thought that they had a chance to win with who they have on the roster, plus like a, you know, a, a B level, C level all star, they would have done it. But, mm -hmm. you know, they sat back, they made small trades, they made small signings, they did that housekeeping where they brought back Trey, they, you know, extended Devin Vassell, they extended Zach Collins, they brought back Mamu, they brought back Julian Champagny, like they're, they're not in a rush. And like, even Brian Wright, when he was on NBA TV during all the summer league and draft stuff, like, he, he made it clear, like, we're not, we're not trying to, like, accelerate this. We're trying to grow this organically. We're trying to just build something that lasts. And, and I think that's where some people kind of get lost is that they just want to see the Spurs right back there. And it's like, you know, there's not – teams just don't do that. That's just not something that happens very often. Yeah, absolutely. It's funny. It's, that's exactly what we were pretty much talking about right yeah. before this. Just <laughs> basically saying, like, they have no need to rush it. You know, like, his development, his health is the main concern right now. And just getting better and growing as a team, because you guys are, like, a really young team. So, like, could you guys rush the process and, you know, try to win and make the play-in and fight for a playoff spot? Absolutely. I think Wimby's talented enough. You guys are a good enough organization. But, like I said, it, it just makes more sense for, you know, to worry about his health. Um, worry about his development and just build an overall good roster so that you guys can really contend for years to come. Right. Um, I think we even brought up, you know, trying to compare the situation to that with the Rockets who did go out and make those big signings and spent a yeah. lot of their cap space. <laughs> um, but it's, it's a different situation where you kind of even saw it towards the end of the year, they ended up having to move off of some younger assets. They're, they kind of have run out of spots to consolidate young talent. So that kind of has to accelerate the process where you are kind of forced to then now is the year you have to go and try to start contending with the pieces that you have, because we can't just sit here and try to keep compiling picks to the lottery because we don't have roster spots for all those yeah. guys. 
Um, so definitely very different situations and um, one that I think makes sense for both sides. Like in the Rockets position, you kind of have to do that. But in you're in the Spurs position, don't unnecessarily accelerate what doesn't have to be. Um, you also mentioned, um, you know, Wemby in Summer League as well. Um, and obviously after Summer League, he had kind of the, the quote that really made headlines <laughs> saying that, you know, he didn't really know what he was doing. He's trying to learn, you know, for the next games and be ready for the season. Um, I wanted to ask you um, what biggest changes you saw from his two summer league games to this preseason where uh, and I have his stats pulled up here. He, he played just over 20 minutes per game, ended up averaging 19.3 points, almost three blocks per game, a steal per game, almost five rebounds and one and a half assists, which is like insane per 36 numbers. Um, so really just what, what growth did you see from him from those two summer league performances to how comfortable, um, he looked this preseason? Yeah. And I don't, I don't want to come off as a hater. Cause I, I think some people probably will take this as me hating, but I think really the biggest difference was just having that downtime. Like this is a guy who didn't miss a single game in the French league, right? He didn't miss a single game. He played every single game in the playoffs. He played every single game in the regular season. He led the league in minutes, he led the league in shots, he led the league in blocks, he led the league in rebounds, he led the league in points. Like, he led the league in basically every important statistic, and he carried the weight for a team all year long. He didn't miss any of the Euro Cup competition either. Like, he was there for every single game. And this is a guy who previously had missed a ton of games. Like, you know, he's just a skinny dude. He was even skinnier, if you can believe that, like, a year ago, two years ago. So, like, him having that off time to really, like, work on his body rest a little bit, recuperate, and then actually get to play with NBA level players. And that, you know, that's no offense to, you know, guys like uh, Eric Stevenson or, or, you know, any, anybody else who was on the summer league roster, mm -hmm. like now he's getting to play with Jeremy Sohan. Now he's getting to play with Devin Vassell. These are guys who can take some responsibility off his shoulders, you know, make life easier for him. I think that was the biggest difference. Cause I felt like he came directly from that to the draft and then immediately summer league. Like he didn't have a second to breathe. Um, and he was probably right. exhausted, right? And like there was a target on his back. Everybody wanted to go after him, right? You don't want to be the coaching staff that, or, or even the player that lets Wimby go off for 40 in his summer league debut or his second game in summer league. And like, I think just having that downtime was really huge for Wimby. Um, but as far as like his game and, you know, specifically anything in his game, I'm not sure that anything really, uh, you know, stood out too much more for me than it did, you know, a, a few months ago. Yeah, absolutely. Definitely this looks a lot more comfortable. Um, like, you know, he's got his feet wet a little bit. Definitely look a lot more comfortable. But because all eyes were watching him in the summer league, and it's going to be like that pretty much all season and the rest <laughs> of his career. Yeah. Um, but basically speaking of that, because you guys actually had a one national tele te national televised game <laughs> last year, going from that to yeah. 19. Um, so for the people that's kind of not really familiar with Spurs basketball, what could you say is um, a realistic expectation of the new era of Spurs basketball moving forward? Yeah, I think for people who didn't see this team or too much of this team and they're not familiar with them, I think one of the things that will probably surprise people is the starting lineup, right? Like this team is a team that's ready to play tall ball. Like everybody was kind of going small ball, pace and space. This is a team that I think they're going to struggle a little bit spacing the floor. Like for as good as Wimby is at shooting the ball, like never has shot above 27% as a professional for an entire season from three. Jeremy Sohan's not really a shooter. Uh, like they're going to have some spacing problems, but they're not going to have problems defending. They've got a lot of guys with really good feet. Guys are good on the defensive end, whether that's like a man to man assignment or as team defenders, like, and, and the short, I'm, I'm trying to think right now. I don't have the numbers like in front of me, but I think the shortest guy in that lineup is Devin Vassell or Keldon Johnson. And they're like yep. six, six, like that's insane. They're, they have an insanely tall lineup. So I think that's the first thing that's going to stand out is one, they're going to be huge. And two, when they had that starting lineup on the on the court, uh, they were at like a 121 possessions per game pace. Like, that's insane. Like, they are going to play fast. They're going to be locked in on the defensive end. Um, I don't know if we can promise anything more than that because I think they're still trying to figure everything out. But if, if those are the two things that I could tell fans to watch for is just, hey, be ready for those big lineups and be ready for them to, you know, really push the pace because that's really their MO this season. Yeah, I, I'm glad that you brought that up because I <clears throat> wanted to ask you this because I, I saw that they were starting to roll it out in the preseason um, with Jeremy Sohan really kind of <laughs> taking over like the point guard position. Um, I'm interested to know kind of what your thoughts are and like 
outlook wise on trying to develop him as kind of like a lead ball handler and playmaker for this offense? Yeah. Uh, yeah, again, like I think some people will probably label me as a hater, but I think it's good for them to experiment with it. Like, you know, get his feet wet. Let's see what he can do. Let's get him some reps, but I, I don't really see it. Like we've seen big guys who would, I guess, traditionally be considered forwards who, you know, they take the brunt of that, uh, you know, ball handling responsibility, mm -hmm. playmaking responsibility. And the guys who do that full time, who, you know, they look comfortable doing it. They look natural doing it. You know, there's not many of them. There's the Luka Doncic's of the world, the Josh Giddies of the world, the Kate Cunningham's of the world. And like Jeremy Sohan can, can back you down into the post and then he can kind of like facilitate from there. But as far as ball handling goes, he's not super shifty. Mm -hmm. his, his handle's kind of high. When smaller defenders get up under him, he gets uncomfortable. He kills his dribble prematurely. Like, I think he's a good passer when he's stationary. I don't think he's great on the move, right? He's not like whipping out live dribble skip passes to the corner. He's not navigating through traffic um, and, and hitting you with a pocket pass. Like, that's not Jeremy Sohan. And so when I think of him as a point guard, I kind of think of him as like maybe more of like, a part-time ball handler rather than like a lead initiator and i think that's what's going to be a lot of uh, of what's going to happen for the spurs this season is a lot of these guys are going to come together and a lot of them are going to share that playmaking load you know sohan may take the ball up the court but he's probably not going to be the guy who's dribbling you know pounding the rock who's going to get him into their sets every time down and we saw a ton of it from uh you know, uh, uh, Zach Collins, where they were running a lot of high-low action for him and Wimby, or they had him in the uh, on the elbows or in the on the on the block. You know, facilitating from there. They had Devin Vassell running some pick and rolls. They had Keldon Johnson running some pick and rolls, and and I think that's probably what we're going to see is a lot of uh, spreading the wealth. Like I and, and like again, I love Sohan. I think he's a really solid prospect, especially on the defensive end. But like, and I'll I'll ask y'all, like, do you see him in that same category as a Josh Giddy or Kate Cunningham or a Luca? And like, those are special players, but as like right. true point forwards, you know, guys who are jumbo creators. I just I don't see him in that vein. No, I I think you hit it right on the head. Like like those are guys who can be very comfortable operating with the ball in their hands for a large portion of the time and being the lead initiator for an offense. And I cannot imagine watching Jeremy Sohan do that for long stretches of time. Um, the, like you said, the ball handling is just not to the level that would be required to, to really play on the ball that much at that, that kind of frequency. So I was surprised when I, I saw it, but like you said, I think it makes sense for them to just try things and like, yeah. there's really no <laughs> harm in it at this point. Um, and the, the worst thing that comes out of it is maybe it does develop him a little bit better as almost a connector piece in the offense and if kind of that's what comes out of it then that's definitely a positive in the long run for the organization so uh, i'm interested to see how they kind of roll with it definitely to the start of the year but really just want to kind of get your thoughts on on how that kind of looked in the preseason yeah it was it was it was fun like i, I don't know that it was super effective it was fun he had some nice moments but you know i'd love to see them kind of utilize him more like Draymond Green like Draymond mm -hmm. Green's not taking the ball down every time he's not doing anything crazy as far as ball handling goes but he's really good with those give and goes he's really good on the dribble handoffs knowing when to you know keep it and you know attack the rim or you know when to give it up to to his guard like you know the Spurs don't have the same personnel as as the Warriors nobody does but like I'd love to see them kind of utilize him like that and also as like a short roll passer like he does he was really never used as a pick and roll Role man, um, and I and I'd love to see him kind of used in that way, just kind of diversify things, try everything. But we'll see. I mean, there, there's a a huge, you know, 82 game season for them to try things, and I'm sure they will. You know, they're, I'm sure they're going to try everything. They're not going to leave any stones unturned. Unturned. <laughs> Absolutely. It's funny. Um, talking about all these big lineups and mission match and stuff. Um, you would think with a guy like Wimby, you know, like the, especially like the casual person, yeah, as tall as he is, you think, okay, he's going to play our five. <laughs> And that's it. You know what I mean? But as a guy as with a skinny frame, you don't really want him banging down low constantly. How do you think he'll fit with some of the other bigs you guys have uh, on the Spurs roster? Well, I think he's a, kind of a perfect fit with Zach Collins. And mm -hmm. I guess the Spurs thought so, too, because they just signed Zach Collins to that huge mm -hmm. extension. I think it's like mm -hmm. 35 mil over the next two years. So yep. good for Collins. I like him a lot. Again, he's a guy who can facilitate out of the high post from the elbows, top of the key. Um, from the low blocks like he is just so versatile and he can space the floor too like he's not necessarily a knockdown shooter I think he's only taking like 
you know, max three, four game and maybe knocking it down like a 38% clip, but that's really good. Like that's a stretch five. That's a guy who can do a lot for you. So mm -hmm. I think having him there on offense. And then also, as you mentioned, like you don't want Wemby banging bodies with, with big guys all game long. Well, there you go. You got Collins. Like <laughs> Collins can do that. Like Collins is not a bruiser necessarily. Like he's not huge, but you know, he's got more muscle. He's got more frame. Um, he, you know, he's, he's, got more experience than Wimby and he's been healthy. Like, you know, I know he missed some games last season, but he, you know, for the first time in a long time, we can say Zach Collins is healthy. And I think he makes a lot of sense. As far as the other bigs go, it, like, I, I think Charles Bassey is like a replacement level big, like there, nothing against him. Like, that's great. Like, you know, not, not everybody can say that they're a replacement level big in the NBA. Like he's fine. He's got some touch on his floater. He's all right. Um, you know, as a passer, he's nothing special there. He's not, you know, he, he has some moments where he can kind of spread the floor, but not really a shooter. He needs time to get that off. It's a slower release. It's a kind of a more mechanical shot. But one guy I'd love to see him work out with is Mamu. Uh, I just don't think we're going to see that. Like, I think Mamu Kelishvili's probably buried in the third string mm -hmm. unless somebody's hurt or they're looking to, you know, really like change things up in the lineup. So would love to see him alongside Mamu, but... Mamu's not a defender either. Like his numbers were pretty bad last year as a man-to-man -man defender. The Spurs were pretty bad as a team when he was on the floor defensively. And, and you know, maybe that's not all him, but there seems to be a correlation between when he was on the floor and the Spurs defense being bad. And like they were historically bad last year, but they were even worse when he was on the court. So we'll see. But I I, I like the fit with with the Zach Collins and, and I think he'll spend a lot of time, you know, probably 30 minutes or so per game with Collins. So that should be a good pairing with those two guys. Definitely. Um, I had to ask you about Dominic Barlow, um, <laughs> who watching them in summer league was one of the, my favorite players to watch on the Spurs summer league roster. I just felt like he had a very good, feels like he just have a good, he has a good feel for the game as a big, and he does all of those simple qualities that you want, especially kind of as this, almost like this new, I don't necessarily want to say revital, revitalization of the big man, but you're seeing teams kind of go back into getting bigs who are good screen setters, good rollers, and can be an anchor of some sort on the defensive end and really kind of keep it simple in that way. Um, and I feel like even you know, in the minutes that he got in the preseason, I think it was in the Rockets game, he also had a, a good game there. I think he had eight or so points, 10 points. I was at that game. Um, and he just, again, it feels, feels like he has a good feel for the game. Um, he gets in the post, he's able to seal off bigger guys, can identify mismatches and kind of call for the ball quickly. Um, I know he's on the two-way deal, but wanted to also kind of gauge how you would feel about him and Wemby potentially playing together for, you know, maybe even small stints of minutes throughout the season just to see what that would look like and kind of just his progression um, so far in San Antonio. Yeah, I would love that. I'm a huge Dom Barlow guy. Uh, I watched a lot of him when he was with Overtime Elite. The number one thing that stood out for me with him was, again, that athletic fluidity, kind of like mm -hmm. Wimby, obviously not the same size. He's only about 6'9-ish, 6'10-ish, but he's just so fluid running the floor. Um, you know, he's not super explosive, but in space, he can be a lob target. He's a good screen setter. He's a smart roller. He's a good short roll passer. And he's shown like kind of like, uh, you know, Charles Bassey. I think he's a little bit smoother as a shooter, but he can stretch the floor out a little bit to the mid range. When he has time, he can shoot from three in the corners. So... I like him a lot, um, and maybe this is a hot take, but to me, I, I see a lot of Al Horford in him. Now, he has a long way to go before mm. he's Al Horford, and like, you know, maybe that doesn't excite some people, but, you know, Al Horford's like a four-time, five-time All-Star. That's a really good yeah. player, and like, they're similar size, similar frame. You go back and watch Al Horford from his young days with the Hawks, like, he was a really smooth athlete, and he was a really smart player, and when those two things really, you know, intersected, for him and his career, he became a really solid kind of like glue guy for that Hawks team. And then again, for this Boston Celtics team. So I don't know if, you know, Barlow ever gets to that level. That's a really tough level to get. But if he can kind of continue to develop, um, you know, cut down on some mistakes, learn the ins and outs of the game a little bit better. Like, I think he has a lot of physical similarities to him. And I think there's some skill similarities, though. Obviously, you know, Horford has got elite feel as far as big men go. But I would love to see him play alongside Wimby. 
Um, you know, whether that's Wemby at the four and Barlow at the five or vice versa, I, I think they could work really well together because they're both, I mean, you don't necessarily want them on the perimeter, you know, guarding smaller guys, but they are both more than capable of, you know, stepping out on the perimeter and holding their own against guards and wings and containing dribble penetration. Like they're both really solid in that area for big men. So would love to see the versatility, um, you know, especially scheme versatility that that provides the Spurs, especially because they're moving into that more switch heavy defense over the last couple of years, especially this season. I expect them to move more towards that even more this year. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't think I'd heard <clears throat> the Al Horford comparison before, but I definitely can see, like you said, the, the athleticism and the fluidity and like I said, the, the feel for the game is always what jumps out to me when I watch him play, whether it was in summer league or in the preseason. It's always in limited minutes, but I feel like his impact is felt immediately once he steps onto the court. He just seems to be in the right place at the right times and make the right plays when he needs to. Yeah. What were you about to, to say, Dane? I, I was going to say, um, like, because on this podcast, I'm never, I'm never going to be a liar. Um, obviously, <laughs> you know more about the Spurs than I do. Billy's a huge Spurs guy. <laughs> And um, one person he has been preaching is Devin Vassell. Um, now, when I was talking about people who haven't really watched much of the Spurs, kind of was talking about myself for the past couple of years, <laughs> I'll be honest with you. Um, but he has been pre preaching about Devin Vassell. He said that's actually one of his breakout players. And I, I kind of wanted you to explain to me exactly what, like, what you're expecting from his game moving forward, his development, and pretty much how he's going to pair well with Wimby moving forward. Yeah, uh, Devin Vassell, and I know I keep saying this, but Devin Vassell was one of my guys uh, back when I published an annual big board. Devin Vassell was my number four prospect in the 2020 draft. Love Devin Vassell. I thought he was a guy who, even if he didn't develop that like self-creation part of his game, just such an elite team defender, like a guy who understands how to make rotations, a guy who's got such elite anticipation in the passing lanes, you know, nearly... I think it's like a 6'10", 6'11", wingspan, like a real plus wingspan, great feel as a defender. And then a guy who can knock down threes and is an excellent cutter, right? Like that's a valuable 3 and D player right there in and of itself. But then you see that self-creation kind of start to develop during his sophomore season at Florida State where he went from zero pull-up jumpers as a freshman to knocking down 28 as a sophomore. They didn't really experiment with him that way during his rookie season with the Spurs, but the last two years, they've really been like, all right, we're taking the training wheels off. We're going to let you do what you want because, God, we're bad. Like, And we need to find <laughs> someone who can do something, right? Like, We just want to see if you can do it. And he stepped up, right? I mean, he went from, what, like seven points a game his first season, then to 12. Last season, he got up to as much as 21 points per game early in the season. He was a guy who... You know, not super shifty off the dribble, but really patient, understood how to use screens, how to get to his spots in the mid-range. Such a high release with that long wingspan. Once he gets to that spot, you're not blocking that shot. And he was knocking it down at an elite rate. And I preached this all last season before he went down, but out of all of the mid-range shooters in the NBA who were taking at least six attempts per game up until the point where he first went out with injury, so right about February, he was only number three in terms of efficiency to Kevin Durant, Bradley Beal. That is it. No one else was better than Devin Vassell from the mid-range off the dribble than, than Devin Vassell, than those two guys. And those are all NBA caliber guys. So mm -hmm. I think he's a really special mid-range scorer. He's a guy who can easily knock down, you know, the three at a 40% clip, whether he's, you know, kind of, uh, you know, lifting or, or drifting from the baseline, whether he's spotting up on the wing, whether he's relocating to the corners. Um, and, and I think he has a little bit of movement, uh, you know, potential in his shooting, you know, repertoire, but that that's going to come, you know, like that's something that it, it may materialize here. The number one question I have for him is, can he kind of start taking that pull up dribble to three? Because uh, no one on the Spurs can do that right now. They're, I mean, that's just plain and simple. Nobody on the Spurs is pulling up from three off the dribble. We don't have... You know, we don't have a Steph, we don't have a, you know, Anthony Edwards, we don't have a Damian Lillard, we don't have a Luka, like James Harden, any of those kind of guys. Like, there's just mm -hmm. simply no one who's pulling up off the dribble from three. And if he can add that to his bag, he's a special player. But for right now, I think he's a really good pairing with Wimby. He's really good off of drib dribble handoffs. He's really good at getting to the mid-range off the screen. And, and, and even though Wimby's not, like, a great screener right now, just having that big of a body, it gives him an advantage. Like, as, as he becomes a better screener, as he fills out his, you know, frame a little bit, I think that pairing with Devin Vassell would become even more dangerous. But for right now, Devin Vassell, I, I think, and I don't know how many people are going to agree with me on this, but I think he has a chance to finish as the leading scorer on the Spurs this season. Like, 
you know, I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent sold on that, but I, I think there is a chance that he could just to take a little bit of the pressure off of Wimby because there's just going to be so much attention on him, you know, on the offensive end and on the defensive end, like they've got to do something to at least try to take the pressure off of him. And I think Devin Vassell is the guy to do that. He's taken major strides every year and I expect him to be a breakout candidate this year, you know, season two, I think most improved player of the year. That's, that's not out of the question. That that was exactly what I talked about in in our breakout uh, episode that we did a couple of months ago was that he is primed to be able, I think, to be in most improved conversations. Um, And one of the biggest things that I mentioned was I think he'll benefit more than anyone else on the Spurs roster from the gravity. Like you said, the attention that Wemby is going to bring to the table. He already is one of the most uh, efficient and really elite catch and shoot guys in the NBA. Um, so I could, that's only going to make that even more easy for him, even more open shots. He's able to knock them down at already a pretty high volume that he takes them at. Um, and then to your point that opens up the ability for him to get open pull-up shots or just even start to experiment with that because of the lack of pressure that teams can apply to him because so much has to be focused on, well, where's one beer if he's coming off of a screen or a dribble handoff? It just adds extra stress levels to the defense, which can open up a lot more windows and opportunities for him. So, yeah, look, I, I've been a big Devin Vassell <laughs> guy for a couple of years now. Um, he was one of the, the main guys I had in our, our list of breakout players that we went through for this upcoming season. Um, I think his game is really, really smooth. I think that he's going to be somebody that, for all the number of fans who you know didn't watch a lot of Spurs basketball last season or even the last few years, is going to jump off the screen when they watch the Spurs this upcoming season. Um, because who doesn't like to see as you know a guy that has a silky game and a good jump shot? Like he's just gonna it's he's Absolutely. gonna catch a lot of people's <laughs> eyes. So um, yeah, I, I've been preaching that for for a couple of months now here on the podcast. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad I'm not the only person in Devin Vassell's corner, man. That guy, I like him so much. I think he's a real special player. And like, I, I don't know if y'all agree with me here, but you know, the, the kind of rise that Desmond Bain had where he was like, okay, he's kind of in that 18 points per game range. Can he kind of take it further? And then last year he really exploded, right? He was like 22, right. 23 points per game. I mm-hmm. think we could see something very similar from Devin Vassell, even though their games are different. I think he'll have a similar jump in production and efficiency. So excited to see what he does now that he has a true number one, um, like Wimby on the team. So excited for that. Yeah, I think it, it's going to do wonders for him. Um, I also want to ask you about um, Keldon Johnson. Um, so another guy signed in an extension um, this, this off season um, with the Spurs. Again, I I think obviously Wemby is going to make all of the Spurs players' lives easier when they're they're on the court. We just mentioned with the attention that he's going to bring. Kind of, how do you see Keldon's game progressing um, from where he was last season? You know, already as a you know basically a twenty-two five and almost three guy um, for the Spurs. Yeah, that's tough. Um, God, and, and I know a lot of Spurs fans they they definitely don't love my perspective of Keldon Johnson and I, and I don't like dislike Keldon and I don't think he's a bad player um, by any means. Like I think he's a really solid guy. I just kind of think he's the odd man out in the puzzle or in the equation. Like we kind of stalled in the preseason. Yes. He was coming back from like a minor hamstring, you know, strain. So like we can chalk it up to that a little bit, but like, where does he fit in the offense? He, you know, he's not necessarily a guy who needs the ball in his hands, but He's not a knockdown shooter. He doesn't have a ton of shot versatility. Whereas like with Devin Vassell, he's not Doug McDermott, right? Like he's not, you know, running off of pin downs, sprinting around flare screens. He's not a guy who can like run double drags for in transition. Like that's definitely not Devin Vassell, but Devin Vassell has more shot versatility. Whereas Keldon Johnson's mostly just a standstill shooter and he needs time to get it off. Like Mm -hmm. he's got a really high arcing shot. It leaves almost no room for error. Like he needs to be open to get that off clean. And so when I think of him, I think, well, like, where does he fit in? Cause he's not a great cutter. Um, he's a solid finisher, but not like an elite finisher. Um, he's best getting a, you know, downhill, usually off of a dribble handoff or in transition. But like, as a guy who averaged 22 points per game, I would argue, like you look through the NBA, he's not a guy who you, and maybe this is too simple. And like, uh, I'm like kind of, 
discrediting him, but like he's not a dynamic scorer. Like he's not shifty off the dribble. He has no mid range game to speak of. He shot almost 30% on his floaters last year, which is not a great clip. Like I just don't know what you do with him. And like last year, my problem wasn't really that like he wasn't a good scorer. I think he was excellent for how much of a burden he had to take on for a role that he probably wasn't ideal for. The problem with Devin or with Keldon Johnson was defensively, he was always out of place. He was missing rotations. He was too heavy footed to stick with guards, but he was too small to bother forwards um, or guard in the post. And so it was like, what do you do with a guy like that? And like he showed a commitment or recommitment to defense. He got in really good shape this off season. He's talked all summer about like, hey, I want to be a great defender. I, you know, I realize, you know, I have not been up to standard on that end. And like, I believe he wants to get better and he showed that he could be a little bit better. But at the end of the day, I just don't know where he fits long term. You know, like he's not getting paid a ton of money. It'll look fine. Like the, the extension will look fine. It's not a ton of money. Like percentage mm-hmm. of the cap wise in like two or three years, it'll be like eight, nine percent of the cap. Yeah. That's nothing. It's a great deal for him. I just don't know where he fits in the grand scheme of things. And for that reason, I, I kind of would love to see them move him back to the bench where he has, you know, more freedom to score, where he gets more touches, where he can kind of be the man. And he's also playing, you know, lesser defenders with other second units. But I don't know if they're going to do that to him. Like he's, I think he's kind of sub- cemented himself as like one of the faces of the franchise. So we'll see what happens there. Pop said like the, the starting lineup is not set in stone forever, but at least for the you know beginning of this new season, he's going to be in that starting lineup. So I think that's something to watch. Like, how do they use him? Where does he fit in? And how does he find his rhythm? Like, he's a guy who I think kind of needs to be in a rhythm to be effective. So we'll see what happens with, with Keldon. I'm trying to be as, as nice as I can to Keldon. I like Keldon Spurs fans. I do not dislike Keldon. I just have a lot of questions, and I, ha- I don't have answers yet. Yeah, no, I... I view it very similarly, and that's almost kind of what I was trying to allude to is just like of of all the players, especially like the the guys that you expect to be with the franchise long term, it feels the fit with Kelton, like you said, is not the most seamless. Um, like I would say it's tough because he has become kind of one of the bigger names. He's on all of their, you know, in arena video cuts. The fans love him, but Sometimes those tough decisions have to be made, you know, for the the long-term betterment of the franchise. Yeah, and, and like, we'll see. I think one of the things that's unrelated with Keldon is just his energy and his leadership. Like, I think quite clearly he's the best leader on the team. Super vocal, always positive, always, you know, going to his teammates, making sure that their chins are up. Like, he, I think that's almost something that you can't quantify. So I'd love to see him on this team long-term. Again, it's just like, does, do those... In, you know, intangibles make up for like the awkward fit. So we'll, we'll see. I'm rooting for Keldon. Uh, I think he's a really solid player, but you know, where, where does he fit long-term? We'll just have to, you know, figure that out as, as the season unfolds. Yeah. It's funny because I I'm looking at their roster again. um, And we were talking earlier, me and Dame about the Warriors uh, lineup, especially without Draymond or even with Draymond. Like you said, their their shortest <laughs> player is Keldon, and he's you know six five, six six, and that's almost as tall as Draymond, who's going to be the tallest <laughs> player in a lot of those those Warriors lineup. That's wild. <laughs> yeah, it is like it is definitely like the complete opposite in terms of trying to put height construction together in a on a lineup. <laughs> I'd at least rather my lineup be super tall than super short. I'm gonna be honest with you. I'd rather be <laughs> somewhat of a matchup nightmare in that aspect. Yeah, I uh, we've we've talked a lot on the podcast about the decision to basically go smaller with the Warriors with with the Chris Paul trade. Um, and I know this is unrelated to the Spurs, but I'm I'm always fascinated to see because I feel like there is a rift in some ways among NBA fans and how they view what the Warriors outlook is with this current setup of their roster. So, what do you think about the, the Chris Paul trade and, and <laughs> the, the potential lineup of CP three, Steph, Clay Wiggins and Draymond or Wiggins, Draymond and Looney, whatever combination that is. 
Yeah, Dame, I think I'm with you. With I'm not super into the small ball lineup. I'd rather have tall players, right? Like, right. it's not necessarily like um, that. Having small players is bad, but I do think it like really limits what you can do defensively. And like, we we know that Chris Paul can share a ball with someone who's ball dominant. We've seen him do it before with James Harden. And you know, Steph Curry's not really that ball dominant. A lot of his you know points come off of assists. He's like excellent screener, excellent cutter, excellent shooting off of screens, excellent off movement. Like we know he can do it without the ball, but like defensively, what do you do? Like Chris Paul's very old. Now. Like and no offense to Chris, like he's <laughs> he's a legend, Hall of Famer mm-hmm. for sure. But like defensively, he's not what he used to be. He's no longer an all right. defense guy. Steph Curry's added muscle, but you know he's getting up there in age. He's 35, 36 years old. Draymond's going to be out for a while. So what, Kev- Kevon Looney's your biggest player for a little while. Even if Draymond comes back, like, I, I don't know. I just don't, I don't love it because I feel like you're missing some shooting and you're missing some, like, off-ball versatility. And I, I don't know what to make of the Warriors. Like, when I look at that roster, I think, oh, like, they should have the talent to make a playoff run. But I also think they have the... Maybe not to the same degree that the Lakers had when they had like Steve Nash and Kobe and Lamar and Dwight Howard, where it was like, you know, there's only one ball and so many hands that it can go into. But like they do have that problem a little bit and they're really small, which I think those are two problems that kind of damn you. So like I wouldn't be surprised if they kind of end up floating somewhere near like 500 all season. Like I, I just don't know how that works with that roster construction. Yeah, we we said the same exact thing pretty much. <laughs> like the same exact thing. Like all like I said, we talked about it before. Offensively, I feel like they might be able to figure out a little bit. Like Chris Paul's smart. All these guys are veterans, they've experienced. They might be able to figure out offensively. But my main thing was defensively. Like a lineup with Chris Paul, Stephen Curry, and Clay Thompson all on the floor at one point is it just sounds bad. Like like you said, Chris Paul's not the defender he was before. He Clay is not the defender he Clay was. Clay isn't before. either. Yeah, you're right. Exactly. So it's like defensively, I just I can't see a world where I mean, can, obviously, can they make the playoffs? Of course, you have Stephen Curry. Um, I can't see a world where they really get into the playoffs, and then a team that that really gets to scheme up against them strictly for a series. I can't see a world where they really beat any of the good teams in the West. So I, I completely agree with what you're saying. Yeah, it's going to be tough sledding. I would not want to be in Steve Kerr's or Mike Dunleavy's <laughs> season, season right. at all. They tough. have a lot of questions that need answering. I don't know if those answers are on that roster right now. <laughs> um, I also have to touch on, I guess, both the I mean, rivalry is not the right word. The fans <laughs> want to make it a rivalry, but... Either, you know, the the Wemby versus the Rocket stuff or even Wemby <laughs> and, and, and Chet with the, the Thunder. Yeah. Um, kind of just what are your, your thoughts and feelings towards that um, as a Spurs guy and like your outlook on, you know, what those might play out to be this season or really kind of just in the, you know, the long term for their, his career um, against either that franchise or against Chet specifically, because I'm sure the two of them will probably be in constant comparisons just because of the the unicorn like aspect yeah. to their games. Yeah. I mean, I think they have a chance to have like one of those generational rivalries, like along the lines of, you know, Dirk and Timmy or KG and Timmy, or, you know, even like KG and Dirk, like where you talk about one, somebody's going to be like, Oh, well that guy was even better. And then, you know, it's like one of those age old debates, right? Like I think they could really have a chance to, because you're right. They're so, I guess similar from a physical standpoint, they're both like over seven two. They're both really skinny. They can both handle the ball. They can both shoot. They're both good passers. They're both really solid rim protectors. Um, you know, they're good weak side defenders. Uh, because like neither of them are really traditional centers, right? You're not just like stationing them in the post and saying like go protect the rim. A lot of their blocks come from those weak side rotations where they're covering like insane amount of, insane amount of ground. Like, yeah, I think there, there's going to be a lot of comparisons between them. The one thing I will say for like any rivalry is you can't have a rivalry if the teams are bad. Um, And like right now, under probably are on that upward trajectory where they're going to be really good this season. Like I really believe in Shea. I believe in Jalen Williams. I love Josh Giddey. I I think Lou Dort makes sense with that team. Like I think they've got a really solid core. Uh, The Spurs are still building. Like I I don't think they're going to be really good. And as far mm. as like their rivalry with the Rockets, maybe I know fans really want that. Mm-hmm. And like, they really hold on to the like Hakeem and David <laughs> Robinson. And then like, you know, the Tim Duncan and Tracy McGrady facing, you know, like with Yao Ming, like 
that even like uh, Kawhi Leonard and James Harden, but like we're we're not in those days anymore. These are two teams that literally won a combined forty four games a year ago. Like I don't even think that would have got you in the playoffs if you combine those wins. Like <laughs> yeah, no. you can't have a rivalry if everyone's bad. And I'm not yeah. saying like these teams are going to be bad forever. I think they both have really bright futures. Love Amin Thompson. Absolutely love Alperin Shingun. Like I think they've got a really solid core in Houston. They, they're Jalen Green. Like they're figuring stuff out, but. So are the Spurs. Like both teams are figuring stuff out. Give it a few years. Maybe then there'll be a rivalry. But for now, like they just they just need to figure out who's gonna be on their team in the next couple of years and like what direction they're heading in. Um I think those are gonna be their main concerns before like let's start this rivalry again. Cause they're they're not ready for that yet. It's it's so funny because you're you're one hundred percent not wrong, but the Rockets fans do not care. Yeah. <laughs> the fans Some of them just... are wild too, right? Yeah. They're like tell they're like, oh, like Praying hands like Wimby t- tears his ACL. I'm like, right, right. What? Why? Like, it's just extreme. basketball. Like, chill. Right. It's just basketball. Yeah, they, yeah. They, they go to the way too far. Go to the extreme. Saw a couple of Rockets fans on, especially on like Twitter or anything like that. It, it can get pretty ugly for sure. So that's, that, that's just funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the fans will really, Rockets, and I've seen some Thunder fans too. Like, they're not going to not let it be a rivalry. It'll be a rivalry yeah. every time they play. Both the teams could be playing for absolutely nothing in the lottery. <laughs> Does not matter. Um, and I also, I really love something that you brought up, kind of mentioning how both him and Chet really thrive kind of as coming in as help side defenders and rim protecting in that way. Um, that was something that kind of going back to how Wemby fits with some of the other bigs on that roster. I think we're going to start to see a lot more teams utilize guys almost in similar ways to kind of how Memphis does with Jaron Jackson. Yeah, yeah are, exactly. You always exactly. play like kind of a more like traditional big to do some of that dirty work, bang with the bigger bodies, as we've mentioned. Um, and even in Memphis's case, like he, Steven Adams, like get well soon to him, obviously with the injury, but yeah. um, like he handles a lot of the rebounding load for that team as well. And really like completely frees up Jaron Jackson to just be all over the place on defense and kind of just right. create havoc from that way. Um, so that, that was something why I really liked the move to like extend Zach Collins and like at least solidify that you have another big to play with Wemby to at least give him that freedom. Because when we talked about this immediately after the draft on the podcast, we were like, if the offense, I mean, like if it didn't translate a bit, like we're talking, he cannot score the ball (laughs) at absolute Mm -hmm. worst. He's going to be a generational defensive player. Right. and be a consistent all-defensive team DPOY candidate. So, like, whatever the Spurs can do to, <laughs> like, completely free that and allow him the freedom to just roam and use his eight-foot-plus wingspan all over the court, like, that should be Insane. done. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you 100%. And, and I think that's, like, kind of one of the question marks I have for them. Like, Zach Collins is, like, a, a solid but unspectacular rebounder. And I think some of that reflected in their preseason stats. And again, like really, really small sample size. I think they played like three games between the two, like with both of them on the court. Uh, but the Spurs were like bottom five and rebounding during the preseason. They gave up uh, a ton of defense or offensive rebounds. Like that, that's a question I have for them. Like it is, that's the, really the only like big concern I have with Collins. And like Collins is, again, he's like, he's a fine, but not like dominant rebounder. Mm-hmm. I don't know that that's going to be a huge problem. I think they they should, in theory, have the length between like Sohan and Bissell and and Keldon to like kind of make up for that. But um, you know, at, at the same time, like there, there's so many guys shooting threes and there's so many long rebounds, like it kind of changes the game a little bit in that aspect. But yeah, we'll we'll see what happens there. But I, I completely agree with y'all. Like that that's going to be really huge for Wimby just to kind of be like. You know, I kind of described Devin Vassell this way, but like a ball hawking free safety in a way where he's kind of able to roam around and like make plays on the ball rather than just be kind of stationed in the paint. I think that's really what we're going to see from Wimby, even as his career progresses. Like maybe as he gets older, he's kind of more in the paint, but at the beginning of his career, at least this first half of his prime, like there's really no reason he should just be sitting in the paint. That I, I think that would be a, a misutilization of his skills and his, you know, his, his physical tools. Yeah, I think in a perfect world, I could almost imagine where you have like team or gang rebound where you have guys like Keldon or Jeremy crashing the glass and then you really have freedom for any one of those guys to just push it and start transition from there. 
Um, because vice versa, if Wemby's the guy ripping it off the glass, he can do the exact <laughs> same thing. So you, yep. it really does lend a lot of freedom to, to just, you know, open and fast play. A um, couple more questions that I have for you. Um, I wanted to ask you about Coach Pop um, <laughs> and him coming back on the, the extension, I think probably surprised a lot of people. Um, it definitely surprised me. I, it felt like this is, you know, the start of a new era. You kind of almost maybe want to usher it in with a new coach to kind of let them pair together for, you know, most of the entirety of Wemby's career. Um, but he sticks around to, to stay and, and coach Wemby. Um, what do you think that is going to do for not just Victor, but really this, this young core as a whole? Um, and if, vice versa, how do you think he'll have to kind of change, you know, kind of some of his philosophies um, in order to really maximize the talent that they have on the roster? Yeah, well, I think the first, first and foremost, like the thing that I feel he really brings to this young roster is just that they don't need a father figure, but they need that kind of like authoritarian figure to like keep everybody in line. Like, I think it's really hard. You see it with young teams and like young teams that have younger coaches, keeping everybody in line and like holding everybody accountable and making sure everybody wants to be there and wants to do their job. That's really hard. Like, you know, there's more to basketball than the X's and O's. Those guys have to want to do their job. They have to want to listen to you. And just because he has done this before, he has five championships. He, you know, literally 23 or 24 playoff appearances in his career. Like, he can just walk in a building and command your respect and command your... I'm not saying he doesn't have to earn it. Everybody has to earn everyone else's respect. But he's one of those guys who, like doesn't really like he walks in a room and you're listening to him because he's Greg Popovich right so like I think that's huge and you just have a guy who guys want to play for they want to listen and you know instilling the fundamentals in young guys is huge like instilling the fundamentals um you know instilling that kind of spurs culture if you will into them like that's huge and I think that's going to be something that's really big for for this team having Popovich you know does he stay the whole five-year extension Maybe, maybe not. But I think it's going to be huge for the beginning of the Wimbenyama era. And then in, the, in that same breath, like, he's going to have to adapt to coaching these younger guys. And I think he has done that in recent years. Like, we, God, I think Spurs fans, I'm not really that old. Like, I'm only 27 years old, so I'm not super old or anything like that. But if you watched the younger days with, like, Tony Parker, he was a guy who got an earful when he made a mistake. Like he was, he was getting benched early in his career. He was getting, you know, absolutely torn to shreds on the sidelines. Um, you know, he's benched for Speedy Claxton in the playoffs. Like there was no mercy. Like it, Parker got it hard, right? And so did a lot of other players. Um, Pop doesn't really do that anymore, right? He he's kind of taken a more like understanding, soft approach. Like we're gonna let you learn on the fly. I'm going to hold you accountable. You're going to come talk to me, you know, during free throws, during timeouts. I might yell at you, but like, he's not going to, you know, have such like an iron fist, right? Like that he used to. And I think he's really changed that style. Like guys seem to seem to be surprised. Like you have guys like Tony come back and Manu come back and Tim and they're like, yeah, he's not doing what he did when I was here. Like <laughs> you, you guys got it easy. And like, I, I think to a certain degree, and this is like no shot at younger generations, but like players change over time like different generations of people, like they have different standards for, you know, the, the people who are, you know, their bosses, which is kind of what, po you know, Pop is at, the, in the, at this point, right, for them, right? He's like their boss. They have a different expectation for how he's going to treat them. So I think Pop's done a really good job adjusting and, you know, he'll still have to continue to do that because these guys are, it, it kind of pains me to say, but like most of them are younger than me. Like the only guys older, younger, that are older than me on the roster are Doug McDermott, um, and I think that's it. Like, I think, I think everybody else no, is, yeah. is younger than me on the roster. And I, I like, it's just a different a ball game. Like it's a different ball game with all those young guys. So I think he's done a good job. He'll continue to adjust. Maybe Devonte Graham too. That's the other name. That just oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. He may be a little older than me or we might be the same age. We'll see. Um, but no, yeah. Same thing. I, I think we've also just, like we're Dame, you're 24, right? Like we're both yeah. 24. We're yeah. both coming to the realization. Like even watching the draft is like, this guy's like 18, 17, 19, rookie of the year, right. 19, 20 years old. And it's like, this is weird. Like, rosters are getting constructed, lineups on the floor. With like, I'm older than everybody. Um, yeah. It's, it's interesting yeah. to see, especially some of the, the younger teams. Um, 
I also want to ask about the new change to the CBA with game requirements um, and how the Spurs are going to manage Wemby in this rookie year um, in terms of just, like you mentioned, having played, you know, such a big workload um, last season, really all the way up into the draft. Like guys it's already canceled workouts and he's like in the French league finals <laughs> playing right, yeah. right up until the draft. Um, so, you know, kind of how do they manage his health and his load throughout the course of the season, but also, you know, understanding that he does have to play 65 if they want him to qualify for any of the end of year accomplishments, you know, rookie of the year included. Yeah. I, I don't know. Like, I, I think he wants to play as much as possible. Like one of the things he said before he like, you know, skirted out of or dipped out of summer league early was like, I want to be playing, but they told me this is what's good for me. So I'm going to listen to them. And I think there's going, I don't think it'll be a power struggle or anything like that, but I do think there will be a little bit of push and pull with like, okay, we have like the best medical professionals in the world. We've got a world-class medical facility now. Like when they tell you, you need to sit, you need to sit. Um, and I'm sure Wimby's going to be like, I want to be out there for all 82. And I don't think it's going to, there's going to be tension there, but I think it's just like, you know, are they going to give in to Wimby every once in a while and be like, all right, you know, you can play this game, you, you know, go ahead and go out there. I don't think he'll play all 82 games. Like what? There was like three or four players last season who played all 82 games. Like that's mm. an unrealistic expectation. I kind of expect him to play probably somewhere in the ballpark of 65 to 70, just so he can meet those requirements. But like I, I don't I don't think it's gonna be a big deal. Like unless and, and I think, you know, they 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 understand how to keep guys healthy. Like we've seen them extend the careers of Manu. We saw them extend the career of Tony, of uh, you know, Lamarcus Aldridge to a degree, uh, Tim Duncan, Bruce Bowen a little bit. Like they they understand what they're doing there. And I think Wimby trusts him. And I think they also trust Wimby knows like I feel good and they'll let him play games. But all eighty two games is probably not gonna happen. Hmm. Yeah. His health should be the main concern, absolutely, because even Spurs fit as a basketball fan in general, you should want Wimby to be healthy because you just, you should just want him to be healthy and reach his full potential. So I completely agree. Definitely. Um, last question I have for you. Obviously, the Spurs season is tipping off Wednesday night um, against the Mavericks. Um, it's going to be in San Antonio at the newly dubbed Frost Bank Center. Um, what are you just expecting from that, that opening matchup? The NBA is very intentionally doing the Luka mm -hmm. versus Wemby yep. booking um, to, to really get the, the viewership up on ESPN. Um, but just what are you expecting from that, that game as a whole? Uh, man, that is a great question. I think the same kind of way where Summer League, there was a target on his back. Nobody wants to be that team or that guy that lets him go off like – I think you're going to see almost a playoff atmosphere, right? You know, the Mavericks are coming off a disappointing season. They missed the playoffs. Kyrie and Luka have something to prove. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they revamped their roster. Like, they're, they're, I think it's going to be a physical game. I think they're going to try to be physical with Wimby. Now, I think Wimby is probably going to have some jitters. I know he said, like, again and again that he's not nervous, just excited. But, like, if you're not nervous and you are just excited, sometimes you can just be too excited, right? Like you're too excited for the moment. You, you kind of take maybe a, a bad shot here, an overly ambitious pass there. You leave your feet for a block. Like I think that, you know, it may be a little bit sloppy here and there from Wimby and even some of the rest of the guys, but I expect it to be a good matchup. It's a little bit of a later tip off, I think for Spurs game. It's like eight 30, I think, but seeing them on national TV again, having, you know, those national crews show up, all the big names and media be there. Like, it'll be different. Like, I'll be honest with you watching the Spurs, um, covering the Spurs, those media rooms are, were empty like the last couple of years. Um, you know, I wasn't at every game or anything like that, but being to a couple of games, having gone to a couple of games, knowing people who are there every single game, like the guys from the San Antonio express news, there's like five people in that media room and, and it's going to be a different experience for mm -hmm. the Spurs. It's going to be different. Um, you know, even with Tony and Timmy and Manu and the big three, like as much as Spurs, you know, Spurs fans love those guys. Um, they were not commanding the same attention that Wemben Yama was. Like the narrative with those guys was, oh, they're boring. They play by the books, you know. Like that's not Wemben Yama. This is a completely mm. different beast. This is a dude who, you know, just posted to Instagram that he was hanging out with Drake like earlier today, right? Like <laughs> Timmy, Tony, and Manu were not hanging out with Drake. They weren't <laughs> hanging out with like Michael Jackson or anything like that. Like they were, you know, going home reading a book, having a glass of wine, like Wimby is a different beast. Um, 
so we'll, <laughs> I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm excited to see them kind of come back to national relevance, have a different aura, a different swagger about them. And I expect a good game, though. I think it'll have that playoff atmosphere, and I think that'll be good for this young team, especially considering they have been out of that playoff mix for like a half decade, basically, now. It'll be good for them to have that intensity again. Definitely, yeah. It, you'd be hard-pressed to find out what Tim Duncan was doing at any point in time, <laughs> really. Uh, but, but yeah, like you said, they're, the average, and not even, I feel like it's probably going to be bigger than just like even like casual NBA fans. You're just going to have people that are just like, what, there's a 7-4, 7-5 guy that can do all this stuff? Like, I'll tune into that, or I'll watch that game, or click on a highlight here or there. Like he's going to bring so many eyeballs to the organization and really the city as a whole um, in a way that, like you said, that even like the legends of the Spurs past really weren't able to, and not really by any fault of their own. You just yeah. genetically, you're not seven, four. Like, I don't know what else <laughs> I can, can say. Um, yeah. I, really the, the last question I have for you. Um, if you could sum up how you feel about, this upcoming season for the Spurs really in like one word, what would be the word that you would choose? Ecstatic. Like, I don't think I've ever been this excited for a season before, right? Like, I mean, I, I love all the championship seasons, wouldn't trade them for the world. Um, but like as an adult, uh, someone who's like in the professional field now, like covering a team, the Spurs have been bad since I decided to make this my career. Like, <laughs> it's just, it's like plain and simple. Like, they just happened to be really bad as I was graduating college, getting into this profession. Like, you know, not necessarily through any fault of their own. Like, it just kind of happened that way. But uh, I'm excited to actually cover a team that people care about, that the fans care about. Because even, like, we can talk about the national media not showing up for games. But, like, the Spurs the last couple of years, they've been, like, bottom five six bottom seven in attendance and they've already sold out like all their preseason games they sold out their scrimmage that they that they had for uh the silver and black scrimmage open scrimmage and stuff you had to like get in a lottery system to get the tickets for that and like it's just going to be a different atmosphere there's going to be a different energy at the games fans care and like that's the best thing like i'm not gonna have to and love mamu love charles bassey love blake wesley but i'm not gonna have to write articles like why spurs fans should you know, be optimistic about, you know, like XYZ third stringer, uh, right? Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. I can write about like why they should be excited for the team's future. And, and you know, it's not that I was not being, um, you know, genuine before, but now it's like, I, I can say it with my whole chest, right? You, you can be excited now. You can be excited. You don't have to go home and be sad and, and think like, oh, you know, the Spurs are about to have the 35 point blowout loss for the eighth time this season <laughs> and set a new record that you didn't want. Like they might set a record that you do want now. So ecstatic. Like I'm, I'm just ecstatic for this season. Awesome. That is, look, I think all NBA fans should be ecstatic. Not only that tip off is tomorrow, um, but really, like you said, that in, it's not even just with the Spurs, but really just around the league. There are so many great young cores that are primed to be in a position to, not even necessarily compete, but just go out and show off like the talent in the NBA. And I know we've talked about it on, on here before. I really think is at an all time high. Like we've, there are guys yeah. who don't have roster spots who, <laughs> if you think about it, like 10 plus years ago, there's no way, there's no way people of that level are not on NBA rosters, but it just speaks yeah. to how difficult it is now. And then right. when you have teams being able to find diamonds in the rough or like these young guys that can come in and be so versatile and just the way that the game is trending it it's that much harder to make a roster even as a long established veteran guys like demarcus cousins having to play in puerto rico they can't get a <laughs> roster spot um but it's it just really does speak to you know the nba being in such good hands with the youth movement and obviously when is probably going to be the face of what is this next upcoming generation of, of basketball for the league? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and, and you're right. Like guys like Jeremiah Robinson Earl, guys like Ty Ty Washington, uh, who were like literally drafted in the lottery like less than two years ago out of the league. Like Keon Johnson got waived today, right? Yeah. It's yeah. so wild. Like it just, it, you're right. Like you're both right. It's just the level of talent 
I, I don't think we've ever seen that before. And I'm not, let's say, oh, you know, this this generation is so much better than the 80s. And mm-hmm. I, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that, like, from top to bottom, we've never seen this much talent. Like, these got some of these guys are NBA players. They, they're just, just no room in the NBA for them. So, right. Ooh. Yeah, I'm excited. I'm excited for the season. And I'll be honest with you, I'm even excited to see the, the Blazers. Like, I want to see Scoot. I want to see Ant. I want to see, uh, you know, uh, Shaden Sharp. I want to see DeAndre Aiden. Like, they're going to be bad, but like, damn, they're going to be talented. Like, <laughs> right. I want to see it. So, yeah, I'm right there with y'all. That's that's what we were talking about, too. Even, um, like, it seems like every team has something interesting to watch. Like, even the teams that are not going to be good, like you said, the teams that are not going to be good, they maybe they have a young core, they have a couple young pieces, they have maybe a couple exciting pieces. Like every team said that seems like they have at least one reason that you want to watch them, whether you're a fan of that team or not. So this is gonna be a really good season. I cannot All wait. Right. I, I will gladly tune into a league pass game when I get the notification that Jordan Poole has 35 <laughs> at that time. That's what I was gonna bring. I'm like, listen, right. I listen, I'll watch the Wizards and watch Jordan Poole drop four. I don't care, <laughs> I'll do it. Yeah, yeah, the team is not going to be good. They might be a twenty-ish win team somewhere around there, but I mean, he's, he's too talented on offense. Right. He has the ability to go off for forty <laughs> and fifty, and like somebody's got to take the shots, right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, so yeah, it's there's there's going to be so many. I don't fans have it every year, but like those league pass teams, the one that are not going to be on national TV night in night out, but. You have to tune in and watch their games, even if they're not good, even if they're constantly losing. Just the excitement to see some of these guys play, um, even with a team like the Pistons, like being able to watch Cade come back healthy, be able to see him in the yep. pick and roll with um, Jalen Duran, and then obviously him and uh-huh. Asar. Like, um, it seems like Monty is rolling with I think, Killian at the two, starting and having Jay Nivey kind of come off their bench and be like their punch guy for their second unit. So, like, that's a team I'll be watching a ton. And, They'll be a lottery team next year, most likely. Um, so, it, it, like you said, it speaks to the talent just across the board. Every team definitely has something if you are a basketball fan. Absolutely. Um, but with that, we do appreciate your time, Noah, immensely. Um, I don't know if you know, you're the first guest that we've had on, on the podcast. Um, so we appreciate you taking the time um, to talk with us um, really go through all things Spurs and, and Victor Wembanyama and Devin Vassell, you know you got another Devin Vassell fan right here. Um, and I'll continue to to preach on it all year because, like I said, I, he is my pick. Um, to, one of my picks to win most improved player of the year and definitely a guy that I think is going to thrive this year. Um, and even if it's not a huge statistical jump, he'll just get more buzz because of the eyeballs that are on the Spurs. Um, so I'm, I'm very, very excited for that. But definitely we appreciate you for coming on the show um, and, and talking with us. Yeah, hundred percent. Thanks for having me. I'm honored to be the first guest on the podcast. I thought y'all killed it. Like I thought everything flowed really well. I thought the questions were good. I had a good time. I was laughing. I was enjoying it. So yeah, if y'all ever want me again, I'm always up to come back, but thanks for having me. Like it means a lot that y'all, you know, kept me in mind. So thank y'all. Definitely. Definitely. We definitely keep that open because sure. Wemby's going to have a hot start to the season. We're going to have to talk more. <laughs> We're definitely going to have to talk more. All right. Uh, yeah. But with that, that's going to do it for episode 36 of the Off the Glass podcast. As always, if you're listening on YouTube, um, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. Um, and then go over to audio platforms, drop a five star rating, um, and pre download the show. It helps us out a ton. Um, and then follow the socials that you see there at the bottom of the screen at F- Off the Glass Pod on Instagram and at Off the Glass Podcast on TikTok. We appreciate you as always, and we out. Peace. Yes, sir.